Hello, everybody. Adam Parks here with another episode of Receivables Roundtable. Today, I have one of my favorite guests from this entire industry, Dara Tarkowski, who is uh, the managing partner at Actuate Law. She is involved with Cointech and honestly, so many other things, including having her own podcast, of which I'm a huge fan, uh, called Tech on Reg. Um, so I got that right. It's Tech on Reg, right? Yeah. All right. So for those of you that have not seen it before, I will be linking that below. I highly suggest you go and check out her podcast. Uh, Dara and I have been working together for many years. I originally met her uh, while working for a client and um, I was pitching a new piece of software we were building called ComplyArm. Do you remember that, Dara? I remember it vividly, Adam. <laughs> that was the day that Dara told me all of the things I was doing wrong in compliance. And she was <laughs> nice enough to actually tell me all the things that I could do to fix it which ultimately became the foundation for that platform. So something I personally will never forget. But thank you, Dara, for coming on today. How are you doing today? I'm great. It's, a, it's like quasi-nice weather here in Chicago. So, you know, can't complain for October. Awesome. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about technology. And honestly, I learn a lot from Dara on a regular basis, including our cryptocurrency conversations and so many other things on the tech side. Um, but as AI has become a more popular item uh, across the receivables management industry, I thought it was a good idea to kind of have a quick conversation about some of the things related to AI. <clears throat> Artificial intelligence or AI is such a broad topic and, uh, of conversation, and there's so many different things that fall into it that I'm just going to ask some really high-level questions today so that Derek can kind of point us in the right direction for how we can further research the topic. Uh, Dara, what is AI? Oh, goodness. Um, so fair warning, Adam told me he was going to ask this question. And then like I went off on a million different tangents because I was like, it's not as simple as everybody says. Um, but just to, to break it down, I think there is a fundamental misconception uh, amongst industry about what AI is. At its base level, artificial intelligence is really the ability of a computer uh, or a computer-controlled robot to perform tasks that are commonly associated with intelligent beings, i.e. humans. So it really is just the replacement of machines for human-driven tasks. Uh, the terms often frequently apply to projects involving uh, intellectual processes that have the characteristics of humans, the ability to reason, to discover meaning, to generalize, to learn from past experience. That's what machine learning is. But it also encompasses sort of more base level uh, rules-based systems that I don't think right now uh, most industry participants would associate with artificial intelligence, but they really should understand that those are, that's the foundation for it. Understood. And I think from a uh, from an AI perspective, you know, every software company out there right now with every product that they have is basically talking about their application of AI to that product, um, which, again, I, I think is a, an overgeneralization. And, um, you know, all AI, all AI is not created equal. So I think when you've got uh, products that tout their AI capabilities, you really do need to understand what type of AI they're actually talking about? Are you talking about an expert system? Are you talking about predictive coding? Are you talking about machine learning? Because all of that materially impacts uh, what you're being delivered and like what you're buying, like what you're paying for. Sure, sure. Um, now, let, let me kind of ask this question in a, in a, a different way. Originally, I was going to kind of say, you know, what is AI used for in the industry? But of the applications that you've seen, what are some of the more effective um, uses of artificial intelligence that you've seen within products in the receivables management space? So look, we, receivables management um, has this uh, double-edged sword because obviously anyone listening or watching, uh, you know, any of your content knows all too well how highly regulated we are. So uh, right now, I think the most effective applications of artificial intelligence for our industry to sort of meet all of those um, both compliance challenges and sort of like the business efficacy of it really come down to uh, 
modes of communications with consumers. Um, so when you think about uh, human-assisted voice AI or uh, chatbots uh, that are pre-programmed and machine learning algorithms for how chatbots can automatically respond to consumer inquiries, um, those end up being highly controlled environments. So you train you know, the application to respond the same way you would train one of your collectors to respond, um, except you have a whole lot more control over what the machine does than what a human does. Uh, because as I like to say, you know, the machine doesn't wake up uh, cranky in the morning and the machine isn't worried about, you know, the fight that they may have had with their significant other the night before. Uh, the machine doesn't wake up hungover on some day. So you're, uh, your ability to sort of control reactions and responses in a in an artificial intelligence environment um, can really, really increase the level of compliance in consumer communications. Okay, I, th that actually makes a lot of sense, right? And I think will we'll help to clarify for some people that are watching or listening as to, to kind of how that application is actually being used within our space. Um, but you know, with all these products that are coming out that talk about AI in general and, and with it being such a hot button um, kind of word, you know, what are some of the criteria- So trendy. Like, so trendy. So, as, what, what's my favorite line from Zoolander? Like AI, it's so hot right now. <laughs> well, that's why that's what we're doing. I love it. I absolutely love it. Um, but like you know, and so for from a practical standpoint, for those that are starting to look at products that have AI application or or um, some sort of AI involved, you know, what kind of criteria should they be looking at when evaluating those kinds of products? So I. Uh, Obviously, vendor oversight and management for our industry is so incredibly important. Um, it is the focus of the regulators. It is the focus of the uh, issuing banks and the creditors that we're all servicing. Um, it is a focus of, you know, uh, RMAI, you know, sets of, sets of standards um, uh, where we use to govern ourselves. Sure. So the most important thing, I think, when evaluating any vendor, but especially a technology vendor like this, is that you really understand what it is that they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, this is not a situation, especially because of like the applications, there's the front end applications and the back end applications. And especially if you're going to be looking at a product that's ultimately going to be used to interact um, with your consumers, uh, you really need to understand you don't need a degree in data science to do it, but you do need to understand the methodologies um, that, are, that are being used to build it. Um, and if you don't understand those methodologies, um, you should either educate, like figure out a way to educate yourself on it, find an expert who does understand uh, how those things work so that you can make sure you're performing your vendor oversight correctly. Now, there's a little bit of a challenge and a hiccup uh, because the ethics of AI has been sort of a globally debated subject on how to ensure that we use artificial intelligence in an ethical manner. Uh, federal regulators, state regulators have already raised concerns about, uh, you know, when you've got biased data input into a potentially biased built algorithm, does that create disparate outcomes for different classes of protected consumers? And the answer is maybe. Um, and you just have to make sure that you're not using one of those products. Uh, the data science community in and of itself is still struggling with how to account to themselves for the ethics of those things, which creates another sort of level. I don't, I, I would say just another level of challenge um, for ensuring that you really understand what's being done. Um, and I don't think any, no regulator has come up with a set of like ethical standards for how this technology is to be used or deployed. Um, they just remind you that you need to be, you know, uh, compliant with the current. You have to be compliant. <laughs> well, you have to be compliant with the laws that are on the books right now. And the laws that are on the books right now says you can't discriminate on the base of the list of protected classes. So figure that out well, industry like good good luck like figure that out back to a realistic um piece because you know for me i honestly I, I struggled with my understanding of this until i was listening to one of your podcasts where you were talking about the apple cards when they first came out um and i, I remember this con i remember this particular podcast so well i could tell you where i was standing when i was listening to it um 
because it really struck me when we were talking about bias. And I, you know, I kept thinking to myself as I'm listening to this, like, I'm not biased, right? I'm not biased, which I'm sure we all say. No, none of us are conscious of our unconscious (laughs) bias. That's correct. But I thought it was interesting because the point, one of the one, the example that you had brought up was related to uh, Goldman Sachs tying up with Apple to release the Apple card and how husband and wife who are in community property states, those kinds of things were ultimately getting two different credit limits based on the same information in the same application. So basically saying that if I filled out the application and my wife filled out the application using the same information, that we were potentially coming up with different credit limits or different results. And for me, that was the first time where I went, all right, if Apple and Goldman Sachs are struggling with this, like how am I ever supposed to figure this out? Um, so, you know, the, the bias itself, I I think really is a much bigger challenge than people truly understand. So the bias comes in, in, in two different ways. One we can control and one we can't, Mm -hmm. um, artificial intelligence doesn't work without data. Mm -hmm. And the data we have is the data that exists in the world. And because bias exists in the world, therefore bias exists in the data. Can't really do anything about that. Then there is the bias that potentially comes in into the building of the algorithms. Um, We do have control over what goes in to the build of an algorithm. And part of that is, you know, ensuring that the teams that are building these algorithms um, are diverse. And I don't just mean diversity in terms of race and gender, but I also mean in terms of diversity of thought. Um, And Apple and Goldman, you know, their issue was is when they were asked, like, why or these results disparate part of it was like, I don't know, the black, like the, the magic black, out, black box of algorithms, just, you know, this is the results. And, and that's the part that I think the regulators um, did find or will find objectionable. So we can't just shrug our shoulders and being like the machine told us. <laughs> so like, we're fine. Cause the machine told us uh, we can't do anything about the bias that exists in the world and in our existing data sets right now. That's just sort of, that, that, that is what it is right now. Um, and you know, that's a subject of a conversation that's much larger than this one. Uh, but, but there is other, you know, there are other things that, you know, the data science community is really quite focused on and the bias that exists uh, in our artificial intelligence uh, is known, right? It's not a secret. Nobody pretends like it doesn't exist. And if you have anyone who, who says absolutely not, you know, there is no bias in AI, I think doesn't have an appreciation for the bias that is inherent in the data that is used to inform uh, all of the algorithms that are being built. Now, There are some companies that build better algorithms than others. And those are the ones that we should be doing business with. Sure. And I think for for now, it's going to be a difficult, um, it's going to be difficult to identify which ones have the right algorithms at this point. Um, Hopefully we'll start to see more information that we can use to make those decisions. I think the best thing that uh, organizations can do if they want to dip their toe is to just not be afraid to ask those questions, right? Like make that part, make that part of your due diligence. Obviously no one's asking anyone within industry to, you know, replace the data science expertise of, you know, the technologists that are, you know, working hard and, you know, building amazing things. Um, But you do have the power to ask the questions uh, and do some digging about, uh, what's happening and getting those answers um, to the satisfaction uh, of of you is important, not just from like an ethical, moral standpoint, but like it also shows that you are being conscientious. That is a step that needs to be taken in compliance. And you can say, no, we specifically asked this question before we adopted and deployed this technology. And these were the answers that they gave us. So it's a little check the box, but it's also like, what else can you do? Well, not asking, not asking the questions is not, is not going to be an acceptable answer. <laughs> no, I think that's the, that makes a lot of sense. You know, and I've, I've done more than my share of, of industry audits and technology audits through the years. And that you're right. Asking the questions and, and recording the answers and results to those to, to kind of build yourself a little. We bit. lawyers do like to document things. It's true. Yeah, slightly. I'm, yeah. I'm familiar with that particular process. <laughs> um, no, this, this was great, Dara. I really appreciate you coming on and talking with me today a little bit about AI. 
um, you know, for, for those of you that want to learn more, I will link Dara's contact information below so you can reach out directly and ask her some questions. I know I do that pretty much every couple of weeks. Um, and, you know, she's a great resource for any information, whether it be legal, technology, AI, those kinds of things. Very um, proud nerd lawyer right here. <clears throat> Very proud. I'm the best. I, I really uh, am proud to have had an opportunity to work with you for so many years. So thank you very Aww, much. Adam, I'm back at you. Well, and I hope we actually get to see each other again in the near future. I hope it'll be before RMAI, but hey, you know, that'll be kind of a line in the sand at this point. Oh, hashtag 2020 <laughs> dumpster fire. Yep. <laughs> But uh, for all of you that are watching today, thank you again so much for your time and attention. Uh, we will put some links below to some of the resources that we talked about here today. And looking forward to the next video. If you have any other topics you'd like to see us cover or guests you'd like to see us speak with, uh, feel free to comment below and we'll get responses back to you just as quickly as we can. But uh, thank you everybody again and talk to you soon. Bye.